Okay, there we go. Just use the bathroom real quick. Thank you. Just going to give us a few moments before we get started. Hello. Thank you for joining. here. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Okay. So, Elena, if people come in in person, just ask them to be quiet because I'm going to start. Oh, that sounds good. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I should move this over here a little more. Okay, so thank you for your patience. Good morning, everyone. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Thank you for joining both virtually and in person. My name is Dr. Melanie Carminati. I am the owner and founder of Inspira Physical Therapy and Pilates. We are located here in Park Slope, Brooklyn, on Fifth Avenue, right in between Union and President Street. For those who don't know about Inspira, we're more of a specialized physical therapy office. So we do different specialized services such as pelvic floor physical therapy, Pilates exercise integration, visceral manipulation, craniosacral therapy, and some other advanced orthopedic uh, treatments. I should also mention that we do treat TMJ as well. So in some of our social media posts, you saw that there actually is a connection between the pelvic floor and the TMJ. So that's maybe for another lecture. <laughs> so today we're gonna to be focusing on postnatal considerations. I will be speaking specifically 
about diastasis recti abdominis, urinary incontinence, and prolapse, pelvic organ prolapse. So this is a lecture. I also run workshops. This lecture is more informal. I have different people who are joining us here today. Some are patients of either myself, of the other physical therapists who work here at Inspira, or you might be a massage therapist, or you might be a Pilates teacher. If you're someone who wants more information, those workshops that I have ran were recorded and are available for purchase. And that comes with even more anatomical details, Pilates exercise integration for specific diagnoses. I talk about movement contraindications and how to safely uh, use the Pilates method with clients, depending on their diagnosis and presentation. But today, this is a lecture. So it's going to be more informal. In the last 15 minutes, I will be saving for questions and answers. So uh, just a bit about me before I get started so you know my background. I was a dancer who became a Pilates teacher, fully certified Pilates teacher, who then became a physical therapist. I started out in a very holistic background as a modern dancer, being exposed to different movement modalities such as Alexander Technique, Feldenkrais, um, Laban, you name it. And then when I started training in Pilates at 18, that was something that really clicked for me. And I carried that mindful movement with me into my physical therapy practice. And all the physical therapists here are very uh, integrative in how they practice as well. We all do team trainings here too. But the pelvic floor and women's health, men's pelvic health considerations is a particular uh, passion of mine in terms of clinical treatment because I find that there is just not a lot of information out there and there's not a lot of resources. I remember when I started getting trained in pelvic floor physical therapy, I learned things about uh, the female anatomy that I, I didn't know before. And I think that everyone should have this information. So when I'm speaking to you today, I am speaking to you as a health practitioner, as a provider, but I'm also speaking to you as a female identifying individual uh, and a member of the community. So I really hope that we can take this information and use it however is appropriate in your scope of practice. Uh, and also just spread the word and tell your friends, tell your colleagues, because the more knowledge, the better we all will be. So uh, I'm going to start with just some basic anatomy. Then we're going to talk about diastasis recti abdominis first. So when we talk about the pelvic floor, how I always like to describe the pelvic floor is that it is actually part of our functional core. Our functional core is comprised of our diaphragm, the muscle of inspiration, the muscle that we breathe, that we inhale with. That's one of the first muscles of our core. The second muscle, not in any particular order, uh, is the transverse abdominis. That's that deep stabilizing muscle. If you are a Pilates teacher listening to this live stream or here today, you know about cueing for the transverse abdominis activation because it is so crucial for spinal stability, uh, as well as just protecting the organs and making sure that every other motion is strong. There's a lot of research out there about the transverse abdominis too. Uh, then the other muscle is your lumbar multifidi. So the lumbar multifidi muscle, I have our pelvis here and you can see the bottom part of the lumbar spine here. The lumbar multifidi muscles are a very interesting muscle group because they're kind of very skinny, but they're smack dab right on the spine. And these muscles help to stabilize our lumbar spine, also part of the deep functional core. I'm gonna uh, ask to save questions till the end, if that's okay. So then the fourth and final muscle of our functional core, we have the pelvic floor. So the pelvic floor is a muscle group and the pelvic floor muscles are layers. As you can see here in the pelvis, I have some of the 
muscles here. I'm going to put the first layer of muscles back on. This is a female pelvis. So you're going to see a vaginal opening. You wouldn't see this in a male pelvis. So right now, this is the pelvis. If I were to be facing you, if I were to lay down onto my back, this is what the pelvis would look like. So all of these red structures here, I'm going to bring you guys a little closer. All of the red structures here, these are just layers of muscles. As a pelvic floor physical therapist, we treat everyone holistically. I'm going to talk about that later. Uh, but we are able to identify specific muscles that might be the cause of pelvic floor weakness or uh, pelvic pain, depending on what we find when we palpate. So, but these are the pelvic floor muscles. This is the first layer. If we were to take that back off, you can see some of the deeper layers here in the pelvic bowl. So now this is if I were to lay down onto my back, you can see the coccyx right there. And up top, this is the pubic bone just for orientation. So those four muscle groups are our functional core, diaphragm, transverse abdominis, lumbar multifidi, and the pelvic floor. I like to explain what the functional core does as a pressure system. So Brent Anderson from Polestar actually uses the term hydraulic amplifier, but if you don't know hydraulics and that term is kind of intimidating, I just say it's a pressure system. So those four muscle groups are working to maintain intra-abdominal pressure. So the pressure within our abdomen. In an ideal situation, the four muscle groups are working in synchrony, but when those muscle groups aren't working in synchrony, what can happen is you can experience back pain, urinary incontinence, and a slew of other conditions and presentations. So for diastasis recti abdominis, diastasis recti abdominis is the separation in our six pack musculature. So the six pack musculature is the rectus abdominis. This is the most superficial muscle group. I say six pack because when you see defined abs and someone wanting um, that look, that's actually a superficial muscle. It is more of a global mover. It is not involved in maintaining that uh, intra-abdominal pressure. So when the separation happens in diastasis recti abdominis, there is a separation in the linea alba that runs from the xiphoid bone all the way down to the pubic bone. The linea alba is connective tissue, fascial in nature that kind of keeps the six pack, keeps the rectus abdominis together. There are certain populations or groups of people who you can see diastasis recti in. Most commonly it's known in uh, pregnancy and postpartum uh, women, but you can also see it in high level athletes, uh, military uh, veterans or active military members from carrying heavy weight and or individuals who are categorized in the uh, BMI uh, category of obese, of having obesity. So things that cause that separation are just uh, the anterior pressure coming from the inside of the abdominal cavity that causes the separation in the six pack. There are some other things that predispose someone to having a, a separation, a diastasis recti during pregnancy. And I'm just gonna list them. Uh, some of them are having uh, more than two pregnancies, having pregnancies after the age of 35, which is extremely common now, but it is something that can predispose you. Uh, doing heavy weightlifting. Um, I can't remember the exact amount of times per week but heavy weightlifting does uh, put a lot of intra-abdominal, how should I say, puts a lot of pressure in that intra-abdominal space and can predispose you to it. Also, if you have any uh, genetic predisposition to muscular abnormalities in the abdomen, I've actually had a patient who at the age of eight years old had an abdominal hernia and just had a very soft, uh, structure in her abdominal wall. So those things, any previous abdominal histories, previous abdominal, uh, abdominal surgeries, this can predispose you to diastasis recti abdominis as well. So 
what can we do? So there's some things that you can do while you are pregnant um, in just trying to prevent the presentation of diastasis recti abdominis. If you are active in exercise, you probably are already doing this in someone, hopefully your doctor or your PT or Pilates teacher uh, or movement practitioner has advised you to avoid doing crunches because crunches will put a lot of excess pressure through the rectus abdominis. Something else you can do is kinesio taping. And then just overall body awareness. I really encourage people who are pregnant to see a PT before uh, they deliver so they can talk about some body mechanics and some simple exercises that you can do and some hands-on techniques that you can even do at home to prevent uh, diastasis, diastasis recti abdominis. So say that you do have diastasis recti abdominis. From a pelvic floor physical therapy standpoint, what we would do is we would do an overall holistic assessment and looking at you from a posture standpoint, we would assess the diastasis recti, not just how far the finger separation is in that six pack, but also the depth. And this really takes a skilled practitioner to be able to feel for the depth of the separation. From there, we would also assess to see if there's any hernias, because sometimes hernias can happen during labor. Um, from the pressure and just uh, the mechanics of giving birth. And then we would go into treatment. So treatment for diastasis recti abdominis would include different hands-on te techniques to release uh, myofascial tightness in the lumbar area to correct posture, different kinesio taping techniques. And then in addition to addressing the abdomen specifically, as I mentioned, uh, the functional core, we would address the functional core. So we would look to see also in our evaluation how the pelvic floor is doing, depending on how uh, your delivery went, if it was a vaginal delivery, if it was a C-section, uh, this would impact how we would treat. I want to just show some photos quickly of different diastasis recti presentation. So uh, diastasis recti can happen at any point along the line of the linea alba from the xiphoid to the pubic bone. Most commonly, it happens around the umbilicus, so around the belly button. This is because we already have a slight abnormality in our anatomy there, right? So there's already kind of like a softening there. And so we are just more prone to that separation. But also if you've been pregnant or if you've observed someone who's pregnant, you can see how the belly is when someone's pregnant and where that, that mass is falling. It's really falling around that S2 level of the spine, which is umbilicus. Okay, so some pictures, just so you can see some variations. I'm just gonna put it up to each screen so you can see. So you can observe in these photos, the white space in between the red is where the separation in the diastasis recti is. I'm going to put it over here now too. Okay. So we can see in these photos that depending on the person's anatomy, depending on how they carry during pregnancy, they may have a separation in different places along that linea alba. This will impact treatment because we will treat specifically for that area in terms of manual. I'm going to pass this around to you guys too. Um, we're going to treat specifically in terms of manual therapy in that area and then do any taping in that area too. Give me one moment. I just lost the page now. Um, here it is. So if you guys want to, yeah. And I also want to mention that there's something else that can happen, which is known as doming. So doming is when it's not just a separation, but you actually see a protuberance coming out from that um, uh, diastasis recti itself. Thank you. Okay, so what happens then? What happens when you have diastasis recti abdominis? you're going to pelvic PT, what are some things that you can also experience? You can also experience urinary incontinence, and that's because that pressure system is affected uh, because of the separation. 
So with urinary incontinence, I mentioned this in the most recent workshop that I did, the pelvic integration workshop. In physical therapy, pelvic floor physical therapy, we would do an assessment of the pelvic floor. We would start first just observing the pelvic floor. Uh, this is done in a private room. The individual would uh, be undressed below their waist with a gown on, obviously with permission and consent. And we would just observe to see how the pelvic floor is responding first just to natural breathing because our pelvic floor actually follows the movement of our diaphragm when we breathe. So when we inhale, our diaphragm drops down to allow for that expansion and that filling in our lungs. And so does the pelvic floor. I realize you guys can't see me here. So I'm saying as we inhale, this happens. So this is my diaphragm, the top hand. I'm gonna try to move you guys down too. Okay. So, uh, Diaphragm is the top hand, pelvic floor is the bottom hand. As you inhale, both go down. As you exhale, both come up. Um, that is what we're watching for when we do the first observation and pelvic floor uh, assessment. From there, we would go into some external palpation just to make sure that there's no pain or muscular tenderness in the pelvic floor muscles externally. And then with permission with a gloved hand, we would do internal uh, pelvic floor assessment. So for the internal pelvic floor assessment, I'm gonna just demonstrate on the uh, female pelvic model. With a gloved hand, we would insert a finger uh, vaginally. And then from there, we would just go layer by layer because there are layers to the pelvic floor. We wouldn't go um, all the way to the depth of it. We would just check to see, because sometimes there are tender points at different levels. But once we go through all the levels, we can check pelvic floor strength by cueing someone to do what is known as a Kegel. Now, I hesitate to say that word because there's a lot of misinformation out there about Kegels. Historically, Kegels were actually used to treat urinary incontinence. Dr. Arnold Kegel was an OBGYN who thought of this conservative treatment to help manage urinary incontinence. And when used properly, it does work very well. Um, but it's a matter of knowing if you're properly uh, completing the Kegel. The only way to know for sure is to have a pelvic floor assessment with a pelvic floor PT or with your OBGYN. Anyone who is a licensed healthcare professional to, to check to see, because you need to be able to feel internally that there's a contraction around, if there's a finger inside, around the finger, but also it's not just a contraction, it's a contraction and a pulling inward. So if we grade muscle strength in physical therapy, we grade like bicep strength, uh, hamstring, glute strength by resistance and holding. It's the same thing in pelvic floor, except it's with an internal um, finger and you're feeling for a contraction around the finger and then a pulling in. So the only way to know for sure is to have a pelvic PT assess. So one of the things that I spoke about in my last workshop was if you're a Pilates teacher, it's strongly advised that if you know one of your clients has urinary incontinence or they're complaining of pelvic pain or back pain or something, and you know they're doing Kegels and or maybe you actually cue to do Kegels during exercise, it's good to have an assessment. Sometimes it just takes one. Actually, research has shown that just one pelvic PT assessment to make sure that someone is doing the up training, we call it up training Kegel properly, is, is all that someone will need if they have that mind-body awareness. But many times pelvic PTs, we see people who um, are a little more disconnected from their core. Maybe they're not movers, they don't really exercise, or they sit at a desk for a long time. And all of this immobility just impacts the ability to properly engage in those pelvic floor muscles. So, uh, that being said, 
Kegels and up training are an effective uh, treatment for urinary incontinence when used properly. I also want to mention that in exercise, as I went over in the pelvic integration workshop, it's important to be mindful of the cues that you're giving for inhalation and exhalation, especially if you know that someone has urinary incontinence or maybe they just had a baby and really trying to facilitate that natural physiological uh, motion of the pelvic floor with the diaphragm. So remembering that inhalation is more of a relaxation in the pelvic floor and a, and a softening. And then exhalation is a natural uh, engagement or lifting. Um, because when it comes to exercise or just a functional activity, or if you're carrying something heavy, you want to be engaging that pressure system. So you're gonna engage the pressure system, not just through the pelvic floor, but by properly breathing, because the diaphragm is part of the, that functional uh, pressure system, engaging in the transverse and having that stability in your lumbar multifidi muscles. So many of the like final stage rehab for urinary incontinence um, courses of treatment that I work with patients on is getting them to be able to do uh, the Kegel strengthening, to have that proper core strength, to understand the breathing, but then to understand body mechanics and how to integrate that into picking something off, off the floor. Or if they're a runner, what you should be doing when you're running. Or if you're a dancer, how do you integrate that into dancing? So, uh, yes, just be mindful of the natural physiological rhythm there. I want to move into prolapse next. So prolapse can happen in both uh, individuals who are have male and female anatomy. I'm going to speak more specifically about the female anatomy. Okay, so back to our pelvis. So with our pelvis here, our pubic bone actually acts as a shield for our bladder. So we have our bladder right behind that pubic bone. So pubic bone here, bladder. Mm -hmm. Then behind that, if you are a, have female anatomy, we have our uterus. That is why many times if you are pregnant or have been pregnant or you have pregnant friends and loved ones, they talk about having to go to the bathroom all the time because as the uterus expands to hold the, hold the baby that's growing, there's pressure on the bladder. So we have, I'm just going to hold it out here. We have bladder, we have uterus, and then we have the rectum. So if I were to turn to the side, it would be bladder, uterus, rectum. Okay. And what we're going to think about here, I'm just going to grab a TheraVan. What we're going to imagine now is that this TheraVan is pelvic floor of musculature but also fascial uh, musculature or fascial connective tissue, uh, some ligaments as well. So this is just that bottom basin of our pelvic floor. So if we have, I'm gonna try this as best I can. We have the bladder, we have the uterus, we have the rectum. So what can happen in pelvic organ prolapse, depending on the individual's anatomy and depending on where the force was being placed downward, you could have prolapse, urinary prolapse, where the bladder drops down. You could have uterine prolapse, where the uterus comes down. And then you could have rectal prolapse. Now, for prolapse, there are things that can be done um, to prevent prolapse. 
or I'm going to backtrack, there are some things that predispose individuals to prolapse. So unfortunately, um, the pregnancy after 35 is one of the predisposing factors for prolapse as well, just because you've lived longer and ligaments are a little bit more lax once you get to that age. Something else is chronic constipation. So having constipation and not being able to clear your bowels, that excess pressure in the pelvic cavity can increase uh, the likelihood of prolapse. Other things are connective tissue disorders. So if you know that you have a hypermobility disorder or a ligamentous laxity uh, disorder, more laxity there is not gonna work in someone's favor. Also, if you complete heavy weightlifting, so some of the same things as diastasis recti, so heavy weightlifting, because of that uh, excess pressure that you're lifting and it's coming, you know, gravity's working against you there as you're uh, carrying. Same thing with obesity. If you fall into the category of being an individual who has the BMI of obese. So similar things for diastasis recti. So uh, what can be done if you have pelvic organ prolapse? So there are some conservative treatments for pelvic organ prolapse. It depends what stage the organ prolapse is in. If it's stage one, conservative treatment can help. So conservative treatment could be using the up training, engaging in the pelvic floor muscles, working with anti-gravity positions to allow the organs to uh, go back into a more natural state. There are also some pelvic floor advanced uh, manual therapy techniques that we can do to help release any restriction that might be promoting uh, the prolapse to descend more. Um, and then there's something uh, for vaginal uh, or uterine prolapse, should I say, there's something known as a pessary. So if a female anatomical or a person who has female anatomy uh, has a uterine prolapse, there's something that looks like a little donut it's inserted just like a tampon that kind of just holds the organs up and prevents that descent. That is prescribed by a urogynecologist or OBGYN. Pelvic port PTs we will refer. So if I ever have a patient who has pelvic organ prolapse, which we can, uh, as pelvic floor PTs, we can assess. Um, if I notice that, I always refer them right to a urogynecologist if they are a female. Um, because there's things that you can do to prevent it from progressing. So I want to wrap up with just talking about pelvic floor PT a little more, and then we're going to take some questions. I'm going to try to be able to take questions from multiple platforms. So please thank you for your kindness and, and my pursuit in doing this. So um, pelvic floor PT I already mentioned, especially here at Inspira, all of the therapists, myself included, who work here, we are orthopedic PTs and pelvic PTs and integrated PTs. So everyone does something um, integrative in their treatment. It's not traditional. We see patients one-on-one -on -one, uh, for the full hour. We also will be offering a new option starting in June where I have been working with my Pilates teachers here who are very passionate about rehab, and some of them are actually going to be becoming uh, PTs themselves, where we will have a new integrated PT option where you can spend the first 30 minutes with your PT and the second 30 minutes with the Pilates teacher who's working as a physical therapy aide, who I have trained uh, for a reduced price. So that's something just to note if you are someone who's more on a budget and can't afford the full hour one-on-one -on -one because we are out of network and we don't work with insurance directly. Um, I also want to say that for the pelvic floor physical therapy, we are very trauma informed. And I have many patients who have experienced trauma in their life. And if someone is coming in, we always talk about these things before we go right into the pelvic floor treatment. Many times in a first evaluation, I may not get to do the pelvic floor internal work or the internal pelvic floor assessment because we just met and you know, we want to just talk about everything first and the patient has to be comfortable. So patients are always in control of whatever happens during their, their sessions. 
Uh, we are big on manual therapy here. And then we also integrate the Pilates exercises because Pilates is amazing. I have many Pilates teachers who uh, will refer patients to myself and to my team for an evaluation uh, for orthopedic things as well. So if a patient has back pain and something or some other new diagnosis or complaint has come up during a Pilates session, uh, the Pilates teachers will refer to me and just be like, Melanie, can you check this person out? Let me know what you think. And I do collaborate a lot with Pilates teachers in Brooklyn um, because since I am was a dancer and am a Pilates teacher as well, we kind of speak the same language too. So it's nice to be able to just be like, okay, when they're doing footwork, you know, try to cue them like this, or I recommend this instead of that, or hold off on doing, I don't know if there's something advanced, hold off on doing monkey on the tower. So um, there's that. Now, the final thing before questions that I want to say is that we have, if you're watching us on YouTube, check out the YouTube because I try to make a lot of resources available. Since we are um, an out-of-network provider, I try to give as much as I can just for knowledge and so that you can inform yourself and then help inform others. There's a lot of uh, mini lectures that I've done on the YouTube. Also, we have a podcast. It's uh, the Know and Do Better podcast. I interview different uh, physicians, health practitioners, the uh, Pilates teachers. The last podcast I we just released was with Blossom Leilani Crawford, who's an amazing Pilates teacher. And we spoke about the power of one small change. Uh, before that, we spoke about emotional release and our physical bodies. I spoke to a psychotherapist, psychologist who uses hypnosis in uh, her therapy. And then before that, uh, sex after 70. So check out that podcast as well. And now we'll get into questions. What is pelvic floor? What is what? Pelvic floor. What is the pelvic floor? Yeah. Okay. So the pelvic floor is uh, a muscle group. So this is a pelvic. If you are virtual, you can just uh, type in questions in the comment section, and then I will I will be there to answer in just a moment. Okay. So the pelvic floor is a muscle group. The muscles run from our pubic bone to our coccyx. So the bone in the front here to that bottom tailbone kind of like a sling, and there's multiple layers of it. So the pelvic floor muscles, they work in unison in an ideal situation with other muscles. We spoke about uh, one of the deep core muscles, the diaphragm, and one of the back stabilizing muscles, and it just works to maintain intra-abdominal pressure. So pelvic floor, though, the pelvic floor muscles, there's multiple functions. So there's sexual function, there's sphincteric function, um, urinary bowel. So it's not just muscular. It's not just to maintain intra-abdominal pressure, but there's many other functions as well. Also, it just works as a support system, too, because in this pelvic bowl, that's where all the organs would be. So that pressure, pelvic organs are supporting, uh, the pelvic floor is supporting the pelvic organs. Did that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm just gonna look on here for any questions. I'm looking to see. Okay, anyone virtually have any questions about diastasis recti abdominis, urinary incontinence, pelvic organ prolapse. Yes. If someone is in a, let's say like post, like, you know, they had like a stage, I don't know, way past one. Prolapse. Uh, prolapse. Okay. They maybe got surgery, you know, they like right. had a whole thing. How does pelvic floor PT work with a person like post-surgery? Okay, good question. So what happens after surgery 
is that we just have to then relearn the neuromuscular function of the pelvic floor. So it's more of just a re-education. Also, sometimes with surgery, there might end up being some more scar tissue that could potentially form. So we might do manual therapy to release some of the scar tissue um, and just make sure that they get back to normal function there after the surgery and that there's no hiccups. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And with that, like, I would assume you're also looking at that deep core. Yeah. Yeah. A lot. Uh -huh. <laughs> and just like functionally, like yes. how they're moving the body. Yes. So we would initiate, we would initiate with some basic foundational uh, exercises in rehab, um, especially for Pilates rehabilitation. The progression from position is supine, prone, sideline, quadruped, which is on your hands and knees, sitting, standing. And so once we're able to move through being able to maintain whatever the goal is, uh, if it's to maintain the intra-abdominal pressure and integrate that functional core in all those positions, then we would take it into squats, um, single leg squat, getting up from the chair, bending over to pick something up. So um, yeah, and then everyone's different. So maybe that person is a runner or maybe they want to golf or maybe they, I don't know, they want to go kayaking. So there's all these considerations for specific tasks or specific exercises that we take into consideration. And then we just uh, essentially mimic them with the exercise and make sure that they're good with it then. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so I have a few questions. Mm -hmm. Okay, what is the best case scenario outcome for someone with diastasis recti over your post-C-section to fix without surgery um from what uh well i guess i would have a, a few more questions um for this case what is the best outcome with someone who has diastasis recti abdominis over a year post c-section to fix without surgery without knowing how many pregnancies this person has had um if it was one pregnancy definitely you can make a lot of, if it's two pregnancies, still same. Um, there's a lot that can be done. We wouldn't be able to know for sure until we saw the assessment and saw how far the separation was, uh, how deep. Um, but sometimes if it's more pregnancies, I've even helped someone um, with four pregnancies. I think we started at like a three and a half finger separation and she had a hernia. And through slow progress and slow rehab progression, she was able to, to close and she only has a one finger separation, which clinically they say if it's not greater than one, it's not a diastasis recti. So, and she's, she's amazing now. So she's doing like all of her um, prepartum, but it's really case by case. So I would have to know like where the separation is, but it's definitely possible. Um, I want to say too that one finger separation of the uh, rectus abdominis is extremely common in athletes. So, uh, and dancers as well. Dancers are athletes. Um, yeah. So, best case scenario, we get them to closure or one finger. I, I would need to know like how much a separation is. Ah, and so I saw something else that you just wrote in that question. It's not possible to fix it. So that's a good point. Okay, so if you've had a diastasis recti abdominis, the integrity of the linea alba is going to be different. It's always going to be a softening there. Okay, so um, I have a, a workshop. If I don't know if you are a Pilates teacher, um, the person who's asking this question. Okay, so I have a workshop specifically for diastasis recti that's available for purchase, where I go through exercise by exercise, phase by phase, how you wanna work through rehabbing the diastasis recti abdominis. And one of the first things that needs to happen is they need to understand neutral because you're gonna be working in neutral spine, neutral pelvic position for the beginning of your rehab. Things to avoid if you have diastasis recti abdominis, initially, not forever, 
but initially you want to avoid crunches, exercises with both head, uh, with, with your head lifted, with your chest lifted, exercises with both legs in the air, and initially, but not forever, planks. Not forever. But initially, until you can maintain that proper uh, closure, that proper engagement, many times, planks, because of gravity, it just it's very hard to work against. So I always recommend avoid crunches in the beginning in that first phase of rehab, avoid exercises with both legs lifted, and then avoid planks in the beginning. But planks are an end stage exercise. Did that answer your question? Yes, okay. Okay. Um, how much costs? Okay, so pelvic floor, uh, for a pelvic floor, for any actually assessment or evaluation here, the first evaluation is a little bit more than the follow-ups. So the initial evaluation is 215, one-on-one -on -one for an hour, and then the follow-ups are 165. Um, if cost is a concern, like I said, in June, we're going to be offering that integrated option. So that's 135, where you would just have 30 minutes with your PT and 30 minutes with the physical therapy aid. So uh, that's coming in June. Any other questions? about diastasis recti, about Inspira PT, about urinary incontinence, pelvic organ prolapse. Uh, what is yeah. urinary incontinence? What is urinary incontinence? Good question. So urinary incontinence is a uh, leakage of urine when it's when you aren't intending to let and release urine out. So urinary incontinence comes in different forms. There can be stress urinary incontinence, which is when someone is stressing the body. This commonly is seen when someone sneezes, when they laugh, when they jump, um, when they start running. That would be stress urinary incontinence. Then there's urge urinary incontinence, which is when someone has the urge to go, but they can't control it, and then they just leak some urine. That is more of like a neurological rehab or neuromuscular rehab mm -hmm. thing that we have to do with retraining how to breathe, retraining um, some of the loops. There's these loops um, called Bradley's loops that control mm -hmm. different regions of our brain for uh, engaging the pelvic floor. So actually what happens, our bladder fills up. Once it gets to about half full, we get that first, oh, you know, I think I'm gonna have to go. And then our brain, tells the pelvic floor, let's engage so we don't let any, let any urine out. And then once your bladder is very full or you're in a place where you can go in a healthy individual, then you're able to, to control, go to the bathroom, release your pelvic floor. And then the detrusor muscle, there's actually a muscle in your bladder. It's in the wall of your bladder that contracts to let the urine out. Did that answer your question? Yeah. There's also other forms of uh, incontinence that urinary incontinence that uh, have to do with individuals who have had spinal cord injuries. Um, that's more complex um, because a segment of the spine has been cut. Mm -hmm. So the communication between the brain and the nerves that innervate the bladder um, are impacted. And then there's a form of mixed urinary incontinence, which is typically stress and urge together. Sometimes people will have both. Sometimes people will have um, that um, episodes where they are running or sneezing and they leak, but then sometimes they're just, you know, noticing that they have to go and then it, it, they, they have a urinary leakage episode. Any other questions? Hello, Marjorie.
Okay, so uh, thank you all for joining. This was a free informal lecture. There is another lecture on Saturday, June 4th, 2.30 p.m. here, also virtual. We're gonna be doing the same thing. And that will be about pelvic pain. I'll speak about pelvic pain, anatomy as well, treatment for it, and then answer any questions. If you're someone who wants more information than what we covered today, we have the workshops that are available for purchase. Or if you're someone who thinks you need to come in for pelvic PT, um, our number is already on the YouTube and Facebook, but our number is 929-295-6566. You can call or text, or you can send us an email at hello at inspirapt.com. Okay. Bye, guys. Thank you. I want to give you my email before I leave.